Shalom Alechem, Assalamu Alaikum, Irini Mazisu, Pax Wobiskum. Peace be unto you in English. Welcome back. Uh, in this video, we're looking at Judges chapter 15. There are 20 verses in this chapter. Beginning in verse 1, we see an omission of the word even. And it's a little funny but, uh, that uh, when you take out a word, like just one word such as even, it changes, it can change the meaning or even an interpretation of what the verse seems to be saying. So this can, it sounds a little lewd, but uh, because people have different interpretations of uh, what going into means, it it's important we clarify this. So it says in the uh, Septuagint, I will go into, okay, let's go with the Masoretic first. It says, uh, I will go in to my wife. Okay, we don't know if there's punctuation or what. And then it says into the chamber. I'll go into my wife, into the chamber. So it could be taken as, I'm not trying to be vulgar, I'm just uh, trying to explain it that Samson is going into the bedroom and then he's going to, you know, have uh, sexual relations with his wife. That's what it sounds like if you're wording it that way. However, look at what, uh, look at the difference or listen to the difference one word like even makes when you insert it into that context. So it reads like this in the Septuagint, I will go in to my wife, even into the chamber. It's like what the word even is doing, not that it's like it. It is basically clarifying what Samson is going to do, what his objective is. It's to go into the chamber, to go in. I will go in to see my wife, perhaps, is what he's saying. But you know what? I'll leave that open to interpretation. Perhaps he is... Uh, uh, whining and dining his wife he's bringing uh the the goat not not like a pet goat but like to eat i believe is what is happening here uh, visited his wife with a kid we know that's a goat not a small child um is it a live goat or is it a cooked goat i lean towards that it is a cooked goat could be a live goat maybe she has an affinity for for little goats i don't know so that's a possibility as well. So there's so many diff different ways you can take it. I'm not going to pretend I know which one it is. However, I do offer you numerous possibilities. It could be Samson is bringing a live goat. Again, I, I don't lean towards that. I feel like it is some like a meal they're sharing. And then afterwards, he is perhaps going to have relations with his wife or simply going to see her, going there to see his wife. But then it says her... Her father did not let him go in uh, to see his wife, in this case, uh, the daughter. So the, all that just to clarify that one word, and you can see how much trouble one small word uh, can make when you remove it. Okay, in verse 2, uh, it says here, said her father spoke. Okay, no, that's not the word. It's here. It is, uh, I said, this is the father of Samson's first wife speaking to Samson. I said that you did surely hate her. So he said this. Did he say this to Samson's face? Or, or is this something he said publicly or spread this, uh, his opinion among close uh, relatives and friends? It's hard to say, but he, he said it. It was verbalized. But what happens in the Masoretic, it says he thought, I verily thought, so it's not public, it's just his private, his private opinion, his private beliefs about uh, Samson, about Samson's uh, feelings towards his daughter. And then uh, this, this verse also answers my question that I had in the previous chapter as to what happened uh, what, what was the circumstances that 
where Samson's first wife was taken away? Was it, again, was it consensual or was his wife taken away by force? And we see the answer in verse 2. Uh, it's her father who gave her away to one of Samson's friends. And it even gives the reason why uh, he did this because he believes and he said he verbally stated either to Samson or to uh, other people that Samson hates her or that that's his opinion at least that I believe Samson hates my daughter and then um, he decides to remedy the situation Samson's father-in-law decides to fix it by giving his younger daughter to Samson saying justifying it by saying okay she's uh, she's better in the Septuagint or fairer in the Masoretic she's either more beautiful just physically uh, superior or she's better in every way physically and uh, also emotionally and intern internally and externally I think that's what he's trying to say she's a better overall package than uh, my first daughter, the older one. And then uh, it says, we're only in verse 2, it says, let her be to you uh, in the Septuagint. So let her belong to you and you to her versus take her, just take her like property. So you can see a little bit of a more uh, respectful uh, perspective as to what she is going to be to Samson and what Samson is to be to her, perhaps. So let her be your wife. I didn't say that, but that's the implication. Let her be your ownership or your wife or let her be a servant to you and you serve her. But in any case, it's it's worded different and it just changes the whole tone, in my opinion. Uh, and I wrote here, this is a little bit of a judgment, a value judgment on my part. I said uh, that these people specifically uh, the Philistines here in this narrative seem to be immoral people in an immoral society. And Samson's going along with this, and I'm going to address this later in another video as to why is Samson just going along uh, with the, these kinds of standards, low standards, and and why is Elohim approving of this? It it's really makes me uh, scratch my head as to uh, you know, choosing Samson and then Samson continuing and, and seems like a very carnal lifestyle. And, but yet, Yah is, Yah is blessing him. Okay, verse 3. Said to them. Uh, said to them. Who, who's them? Is that the father or to his friends? It's, it's Samson said to them. So he's talking to somebody, multiple people. Um, so yeah, it's a little confusing, this Septuagint. I'm not going to pretend it isn't. Said to them, who are them? Who are they? Uh, but in the Masoretic, it seems to be a little more, it makes a little more sense in the narrative, at least, when you're reading it. Samson said concerning them, the Philistines, that he's more blameless than the Philistines. But he, he would not be speaking to the Philistines because he's revealing his motive. So it's either speaking to someone that was mentioned earlier, but uh, could be his friends, perhaps. Maybe his friends are not part of the Philistines. Perhaps he's talking to his friends. I'm going to leave it open to that. Maybe his friends are, are part of uh, Israel. Um, okay. And or maybe they're not. I, I don't know. But anyway, I, I, I do believe it, it seems to be referring to his friends uh, as the people he's talking to. Uh, continuing, verse 3, spoke directly to them. Okay. To them. And I'm going to put here in, in brackets uh, his, his uh, friends. Perhaps. Okay, uh, mischief. I do mischief again. <laughs> Yah is approving of the mischief, but it seems that 
He's working out his plan through Samson's mischief uh, versus displeasure. So it's one thing to not please them uh, versus working mischief among them, uh, which is a lot worse than just not pleasing them. You can do nothing and still not please someone, but working mischief is just troublesome. It's you're uh, you're you know, causing mischief, mayhem. Just think of uh, Dennis the Menace. Uh, verse 4 torches versus firebrand so it seems to make more sense I didn't know what a firebrand was before I thought that was something uh, like an animal or creature but it turns out it is a piece of burning wood and it's not too far off from the word torches the word fastened it is also omitted so uh, he simply put the torch between the two tails in the Masoretic whereas it makes more sense that Samson would secure it, uh, fix the torch uh, by binding it between the two tails of the foxes. Okay, it just makes more sense in a logistic, logistical way if you're trying to imagine, okay, what is he doing? Okay, so first he took the foxes, and then they turned tail to tail, then he put the... So he just simply dropped it between them? No, he tied... A, he tied... A, he tied the torch fastened it securely between their two tails meaning he tied the tails and tied the uh, torch along with their tails okay uh, moving on to verse 5 talks about the threshing floor so uh, he set fire to the torches and everything burned up including the threshing floor uh, versus the shocks. So shocks is a little... Uh, what is a shocks? Seems it to be a heap. A heap. Uh, however, when I looked up a threshing floor, I, I, I did uh, assume a threshing floor had to be indoor. Uh, but a threshing floor, especially in ancient times, was actually outside. Uh, on a flat surface. Okay. Uh, right. Moving on to verse 6. Talking about uh, his wife's father's house. So Samson had uh, burnt. I'm not, not Samson. The Philistines burnt her. Uh, Samson's wife and her father's house versus uh, burnt her and her father so uh, in the Masoretic it's only Samson's wife and father being burnt uh, alive versus uh, Samson's wife and her father's house which sounds like the actual building or perhaps her father's whole family meaning her her, her father, and extended family. That could be what it means. Or it could be uh, her, her father, and the house. Uh, but usually, you know, father's house means the, the immediate family. So if they had other people in that house, uh, close relations, they would be included, perhaps. So a lot more casualties in the Septuagint. Okay, we're going to move on to verse 11, talking about a hole, a hole in the rock. So 3,000 men of Judah went down to the hole of the rock Etam, versus they went to the top of the rock. Uh, in the previous verse, actually in verse 8, talks about this hole in the rock, or hole of the rock being a cave. So that makes sense, and it's still the top of the rock uh, in the uh, sorry the Masoretic. In verse thirteen. Ropes. The word ropes is used uh, versus cords. So I just imagine uh, thick ropes, strong uh, ropes versus cords seem to be thinner. When you think of a cord, it's like a thinner rope, a smaller. Uh, smaller in circumference, not as thick, whereas a rope seems to be, you know, when you climb up a, 
climbing up uh, an obstacle course like in the army, for example. Verse 14 talks about uh, running up to meet him. The Philistines ran to meet him. Whereas they simply shouted uh, against Samson, but didn't run to meet him. So we can see that they're a lot more uh, excited, not excited in a happy way. They're very uh, zealous to to uh, fight him. They can't wait. They're just they're they're really pumped. And then it describes the ropes that were upon his arms. Uh, they became as tow, which can also mean flax, rope, or broken fiber. They are described as flax in the Masoretic. And notice how uh, they became as tow, so they became like uh, this material, either flax, and uh, which is burnt with fire. His bonds were consumed. So, uh, again, like fire consumes flax, they were consumed from off his hands. They possibly were melted off, or it is a metaphor, meaning they were. it was like they were consumed, because the previous uh, line describes how they became as tow, not that they did literally become tow or flax, but they became like flax, meaning they perhaps they were like they were consumed by fire. Uh, however, there's also a possibility, and I'm going to leave it open to a possibility that perhaps it was divinely uh, burned, like miraculously burnt off from off his hands in this instance. And then in the Masoretic, it describes how his bands were loosed from off his hands, so they just fell off because they became loosened. Uh, but yeah, it's a lot more dramatic in the Septuagint where it's like they were just consumed from fire. Okay, uh, verse 15, cast away. Uh, he, this is Samson finding a weapon. This was the jawbone of a, a donkey that had been cast away. So in the Masoretic, it seems like it was put forth in his hand like a boomerang that just came out of nowhere or Thor's hammer just <laughs> came into his hand whereas no he found this uh, he found this jawbone that had been thrown away it was discarded okay in verse 16 this is where Samson describes what he had done smoting a thousand men with it and he, it seems like he came up with a, a rhyme or a song. Uh, but he says how he has utterly destroyed them. Uh, verses heaps upon heaps. Okay, and verse 17. He called that place the lifting of the jawbone, which could very much simply be a, an English translation of Ramath Lehi. And then verse 18. Uh, notice how... There's more emotionality here. Samson actually wept. He was very thirsty and he wept before uh, Adonai. So he cried, weeping with tears, versus simply calling on him. You'll notice this again later on. And then verse 19, we see the well of the invoker, versus uh, An Hakor. So that's all for this video. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, until next time, we'll look at Judges 16. I wish you all Shalom Aleichem, Assalamu Alaikum, Eirini Mazisu, and Pax Wobiskum. Peace be unto you, and Maranatha.